I want it to be documented, the first time I ever pull a card of me in it. This is super insane. Oh, we got one! Yeah, let's go! I got it! I fucking got it! So then what was the most valuable piece of advice you've ever received in your career? It's actually an extremely raunchy piece of, well, a couple things. My dad gave me great advice, which is your word is your bond. So I was a salesman and so that meant embellishing slash lying was part of the equation in my youth. Mm -hmm. And I've become far less of that, which is amazing, because that helps, mm -hmm. especially in this transparent world. So thank God for that, huge. But I always think about this. There was a super raunchy 80 year old liquor salesman when I was 15 that came up to me and said something super inappropriate. He's, and I don't remember what the context of why he was saying it, but the saying was, kid, you don't know what you have until you sleep with it. <laughs> and it was kind of like the, what he, it was a very Jersey 80 year old mobster <laughs> talk, but what he was basically saying to me is like, look, don't overthink this. Until you go through it, you won't know. You know, there's a great Russian saying that says man thinks and God laughs. And like, that's how I think about stuff. Like, I can have a million plans and then tomorrow a helicopter can go through the building that we're in, right? Like yesterday in New York. Like, I just, you know, that's the extreme, but in the micro of business, I can be like, oh hey, Jason's gonna do this on this huge project in a month and you know, something might happen to Jason's family where he has to go home for a month. And I fucked it up, you know? Or like, Jason will fall in love and like has to move to Ohio. Like, I don't, like, I, <laughs> no, I think about this stuff, that, like as a true operator, I think about this a lot. And it helps me be, by the way, I think if anybody's listening right now, it speaks to why I'm not super anxious. I, I know that I'm in control of nothing, which almost automatically by nature makes me capable of controlling everything. Mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a big thing. I have trouble oh, I like that one. releasing control. I remember, you like that one? <laughs> like that. Super interesting to me. It's a yeah. huge, it's a huge vulnerability. Sure. Because you're not in control. Biggest news of my life, there is nothing besides buying the New York Jets that I will do that is more exciting than what I'm about to tell you. Uh, several months ago, I got into negotiations with Topps, the iconic sports card company, and Topps Series 2 released today. And in the packs of Topps Series 2, this is the first time I'm ever gonna see it, in the back and small, I mean, Jesus Christ, this is small print, I'm getting old. But in the packs of Topps Series 2, is an insert card called Gary Vee's Top Entrepreneurs in Baseball, where there, is it a 12 card set? 12. We pick 12 guys, and then there's, so there's 12 cards, different players, 12 different players, you get one of those in eight, every 18 pack, so almost one or two in a box, I think. Yeah, sure. That's going off the top of my head. And then there's a dual auto card, where you can get an autograph of me and the player. There's a, in one of these packs, for example, I could pull right now. I know it's one in 5,000 packs, the dual autos, right? Yeah. I'm gonna try to pull a card of my, I want it to be documented the first time I ever pull a card of me in it. This is super insane. Oh, we got one! Let's go. Yeah, let's go! I got it! I fucking got it! Let's go! That was amazing! There it is, Jose Ramirez, Gary Vee's top, I cannot believe I just pulled it, that was so awesome! How insane is this? I am literally on a fucking baseball card. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> this is insane. That was so that fucking was cool. That was so fucking cool. That was awesome. <laughs> I'm so glad we caught, my face has to be ridiculous for that. that you One of the latest ventures for him is a curated set of cards inside a Topps nationwide release of cards. He is Gary Vaynerchuk. How are you, Gary V? Well, Rich, I'm okay, but last night's KD situation and my Knicks future has me a little bit on tilt this morning. <laughs> what's, what's the scoop of your Topps national release of cards that you're, you've got a curated set of cards inside? I know you were talking about trading cards last time you were here. Uh, I give you the floor on wh why are you so interested in this? Well, Rich, because 
I basically am an entrepreneur because of baseball cards and I'm 43 in that classic 87, 88, 89, those great, known as the junk, junk wax era, the cards aren't worth anything, but it was the height of popularity of sports cards. Sports cards are the thing that I most associate myself and my youth to and if you told 15 year old me that I would have a trading card literally in packs of tops I would, you know, it, this is sing, this is easily the singest, single coolest thing I'm ever gonna do in my life outside of buying the New York Jets. So this is what top entrepreneurs in baseball. That's what this Gary Vee's top yes. entrepreneurs in baseball. One, one, one in every 18 packs. There's an insert. Gary Vee's top entrepreneur in baseball. Uh, Lou Jano and I, Lou on my team, uh, went through a lot of data, and you know it's a fun set because for Al, every Alex Bregman, there's a Trevor May because Trevor just happens to be a phenomenal entrepreneur. He you know, may not end up being the most valuable baseball card because mineral relievers don't really dictate the market, but I, we really put a lot of effort into who's an actual entrepreneur. Uh, and then, so you have one in every 18 pack chance to get that insert, and then above and beyond that, there's autographs and special inserts. One in every 5,000 packs is the dual auto. Rich, you can go to a store right now, buy a pack of top series two baseball cards, and possibly pull out a Derek Jeter, Gary V dual auto card. So what is what is the value of some of these cards that you're pulling out of this pack? If you just go ahead and throw it in, I guess some sort of uh, some sort of con- yeah, some sort of coating or some sort of protective covering, Gary. Oh, you're talking about the grading system. So I don't know yet. They just came out, and so the value of these cards is going to be figured out. Uh, I'd like to think that there'll be some demand for my, you know, from entrepreneurs that want my insert. So we'll see how that goes. I mean, the market decides on that, right? And so, we'll see. I mean, there's a big national convention in the last week of July in Chicago. I, I bought a table, Rich. I'm literally spending four days at the national convention as a dealer, like back in my teenage days. So I'm excited about hustling there, and uh, we will see what the cards are like. So if I'm going to be doing this, I need to be getting towards the millions of followers, not the tens of thousands. Yes, so I think that makes a lot of sense to me. So I think um, there's a lot of ways to have that conversation. I think um, I think this is super important what you're doing here. I think the thing that I always believe is to get to the millions, it, it's a cliche game of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, that, that whole thing. But if you're not anchored in something that gives you enough at bats that is practical to the way that you live your life, it's unachievable. And what I mean by that is putting yourself in a position where you're recording at all times and or starting a meaningful podcast, something that is the mothership is an imperative uh, part to this model, otherwise it's not achievable. I think the thing that really runs through my mind is what level of patience around the vanity metric of followers is running through your mind. I think, you know, the thing that I see, and I speak to a lot of highly accomplished people with, you you, you answered perfectly, which is the same for everybody, regardless of where they want to deploy that attention. Um, There's a, there's a race to a vanity number that I think is hurting a lot of my contemporaries, people of your ilk, in these genres that I I almost wish that LinkedIn and Instagram and YouTube would eliminate the follow count because I believe that people that actually have something to say would be more on their way of achieving it. Um, But I think that human behavior with those kind of... uh, Because what you're saying is the volume of followers gives you volume. What I'm saying is that people are so influenced by the fucking likes and followers that they become a caricature of that game, not the behavior needed to actually achieve what they're trying to achieve. I mean, that is no question um, what has transpired for me and my analyzing of others that are actually creating meaningful impact uh, only through these channels um, has been predicated on a commitment to output of creative, um, being talented enough to have something to say, and truly just running the marathon with marathon behavior versus sprint behavior. Zero buying of fans, zero caring about the number, making an outrageous commitment to relevant contextual creative at scale, which inherently 
A, puts them in position to have a viral moment which could make what many want to happen very quickly. You're, you know, someone like you is always one piece of content. D-Rock and I always talk, we're always one piece of content away from being at the next level. <laughs> right? I mean, how long does it take to that one piece of content? <laughs> you know, we, yeah, we're, you know, it's, and it is funny that there are a lot of my friends who don't have this impact and size that I have, but have had far more viral singular moments. You know, I think I'm winning by a death of a thousand cuts. But, you know, and so, but we're in play. We always know tomorrow could be the 100 million viewed YouTube video. We do know that. And so, I, I think, you know, obviously, this has me very excited because I think first convincing someone the value of recording everything or a lot of things or the commit, you know, I speak to a lot of super accomplished people, many of giving away, the, the crowd that gives away 50 to 99% of their wealth, the crowd I'm gonna speak to tomorrow at Brilliant Minds and, and it's very hard to get them motivated to do a podcast three days a week in perpetuity yet what they want is 55 million people to really pay attention to them and, and what's really ironic and you'll definitely appreciate this because nobody achieves something of true without putting in the work, like they're also commonly the people that understand how much work comes in play to actually achieve something meaningful. Which is how we actually got to this. In a world where many people are so busy that are achieving meaningful things, how do I eliminate friction at scale to allow them to be able to achieve the creative output model that achieves the goal at hand. How are we gonna ensure that we're still staying true to like the Vayner culture and what we say on what we speak and how all of this change is gonna massively shift us to being like another agency in London? Yeah, so I think, I think dictatorship, you know, my willingness to fire Sarah and Daniel and, <laughs> I, I mean it, I mean it. Like it's, it's a funny answer, it's a, it's a, it's a funny answer, but it's true. Like, there's nothing, couple things. Let's break it down in nuances. First and foremost, do you know how great it feels to not have a board, not be a held, uh, not be a publicly traded, there's, every single problem at Vayner is 100% my fault. There's nothing I can't do. I'm fully in charge. It, it's the truth. Like, it, it's not fun to say that because there's a fuckload of things running through my head looking at faces here of people who aren't happy right this second. So that doesn't feel great, but there's an incredible truth behind that. It's a very easy answer, which is my appetite to make a move predicated on what I think is the right cadence to articulate to the 50 most senior people, 100 most senior people, and their ability to see that through as it evolves. It's a funny game though. What Vayner stands for is also interpreted very differently by people. There are people that have worked at Vayner for seven years that are in New York that think it's something very different than what you think it is. So I think you also have to understand ideology is formed in a very interesting way, right? And so um, that is actually the thing I least worry about on earth. You know, in pockets it can deviate. You know, when somebody is getting bullied by their boss, that's the least people first thing on earth, but that can happen in pockets. It can happen in pockets for four months. It's very daunting when you have passionate points of view and real religious inside yourself, yet the company's at a scale of a thousand and there's a million variables in play at all times and you have to be thoughtful. This market's incredibly impossible because of its laws of like how quickly I can fire somebody who's a piece of shit. You know, like, like there's a lot to, the right? Interpre- we, we live in a, you have to be very thoughtful. I mean, the 360 nature of everything we're auditing now is so remarkable because we live in a culture where everybody's ready to sue about everything at all times and always. Like, it's real fun. Like, nothing's more fun than being an employee. You get to blame somebody. You know, but when you're in it, and you're actually the last, you know, as everyone here has probably felt if you've gotten to the point where you went from actually doing something to the first time of managing something, you have a new perspective. Super easy and fun to make fun of your parents until you become a parent and you realize variables. And so, you know, for me, you know, I have to be empathetic and balanced in all of that. Um, but keeping the, keeping the, keeping the intent the, you know, of being the best communications infrastructure to support the objective at hand 
that is contemporary to the moment of what consumer behavior is about, as like in that narrow definition of your question, that's a piece of cake, I don't know anything else. I will do an all hands on meeting in this company in 11 months and say, we are only doing TV if I believe for some reason TV cut their prices by 90% and now that was the best deal in communications. I am not romantic about a damn thing when it comes to the execution of make, having smart thinking around great outputs creatively in places where people actually see them. brands to build brand down, you know, we're seeing a lot of like out of home and traditional TV ads from these kind of pure digital companies. I think it's a huge mistake. And I think you're seeing it because they're wasting money and they don't care. And I think that they, the biggest delta is we, we literally, what's amazing to watch these brands go so heavy on traditional above the line creative is that the great case study of modern creative comes in the form of Dollar Shave Club. For whatever happened at Dollar Shave Club after the fact, the Dollar Shave Club video is this generation's just do it or where's the beef. It really is an iconic piece of creative that birthed the billion dollar brand. The number one mistake that direct to consumer brands at scale are making right now is not creating long form video on Facebook and YouTube to build brand equity. Um, And that's how I see it. And I think there are a couple brands that are actually, for that matter. Uh, Purple Mattress, if you, if, you, if, you, if you nerd on this stuff, you should go look at what Purple Mattress is doing as a company versus what Casper is doing as a company, right? One is very hardcore DTC and is growing and is the leader, Casper, but Purple is creating a lot of creative, ad hoc, some of it's not hitting, but what, what I think they're committed to, which is something I'm more committed to, which is the $180,000 production and creative execution risk of making a funny video, a video that makes you cry, a video that makes you think, if you hit that, your CAC and LTV numbers get really good real fast. Because now you're training a brand. And, um, and that's the ultimate goal. And then in terms of platforms, what yes. does that mean for social media platforms, retailers, what does this shift mean? Well, it means that the Facebooks of the world, the Googles of the world are getting more of their, I mean, it's crazy. You have two gals in middle of nowhere starting a direct-to-consumer peanut butter brand and two years later spending more money on Facebook and Instagram than Unilever does. Mm -hmm. Like, if you go talk to Facebook executives that run their business, they are getting way bigger budgets from companies you've never heard of than from PepsiCo and Budweiser and all this stuff. And, and that is probably my favorite thing that's kind of going on, literally, literally. When you look at the top spenders on these platforms, it, it will blow your mind. Literally a brand you've never heard of outspending Coca-Cola, BMW. And that's because one trades on sales data and another one trades on internal MMMs or reporting. I, don't, I think it's very difficult to give advice that says, become more talented. Be born with more talent. <laughs> very not practical. So where I found myself was going to another place that felt very practical to me, and as you can imagine, it's all I ever saw for the first 35 years of my life, which was work ethic was a controllable part of the game that if you did that, if you're outworking your competition, practicing after practice, all the things we know about sports and music and theater and acting and all those things, that that was an incredible advantage. And in a time and place where people were getting laid off and things of that nature, it hit the right tone. It was natural to me and the timing was right. To the more nuanced question, which I appreciate, which means you're paying attention, over the last 18 to 24 months, as the world changes, as we get into entitlement era after 15 years of economic or 10 years of great global economic growth, much like my concern with entrepreneurship because there's so much money in the system, everybody's idea gets funded and we're not building businesses, we're just building companies to get more funding. What has also happened is a more human conversation, more Nordic and European centric than US and China centric about work-life balance, about mental health issues, about burnout. I found myself two years ago watching contemporaries, even friends, start to use me as a poster child of bad, that I was pushing too much burnout 
and things of that nature, hustle porn and other things. And I was empathetic to it. As much as I was hurt and wanted to make 500 videos of, in the first book, which is my Bible, I talk about if you wanna work nine to five and make 40,000 a year, but you're happy, you've won. I think I've been, and I have been, incredibly consistent around happiness, not money, and many other things. But to your point, because of my personality traits, what was associated was hustle and things of that nature. So I had to take responsibility for that. And so over the last 24 months, I have spent more time and energy to contextualize everything to make sure I'm covering the basis so that people know where I stand on this, which is what I said earlier. I don't reg- actually regret it because I loved, business is my hobby. But if one wants to go to every softball game or every track meet or you know, work 31 hours a week and they're fulfilled, that makes me happy. I don't get to judge. So yes, I think what's so great about communication and so great about advancements is you can create clarity, you can talk about different things. I talk a lot more about parenting today than I did in the past because, uh, not even because I'm a parent because I've been more in tune to how I was parented. Um, So yes, I've definitely been more aggressive in making sure the things that I've always believed um, are more associated with me because I have no interest in other people painting a picture about me that isn't true. What is the one piece of feedback you're most curious The to truth. Get? Yeah, but about what? Whatever the hell is in front of them. Running an operation is not a education or philosophical exercise. What do I want? I want to know exactly what is an issue operationally right this second to you from your perspective and you running your world. Mm-hmm. And what how can I help? On your, on your leadership. What are you most curious about? The reverse of that coin. What can I do to put you in the best position to succeed? Are you looking to talk to me more often? Are you talking to me less? Do you need, fi- do you need some leeway with your financial P&L? Do you need me to rah-rah the troops? Do you want me to go talk to the most senior client because the client that you work with, which is the second most senior client, is giving you a very difficult time? I am in the ambulance, firefighting, emergency doctor, bat phone business. I am only built to act in helping for you to succeed within this framework. It's, it's, it's kind of massive that somebody says that to you. I would be almost moved if my manager said that to me. <laughs> uh, and I believe when you look at our organization, the people that have been with me for seven, eight years, the people that are winning the most really see it. And the people that don't hear it and think it's a think it they deploy cynicism that I'm just want to hear myself speak and it's an ideology and that I won't actually do it because what's amazing about employees is how many and this by the way I'm going to set this up on the podcast I'm actually very excited to say this I actually think for all the very thoughtful conversation we just had I can feel it in my body right now this piece of content may be the piece that brings the most value I am blown away by how many employees have made judgments on their organizations without trying to address it. The amount of my employees that come into my office on year three, call my bluff finally to address something. I address it in 48 hours, within a month, whatever the issue is. They come back and say, I can't believe you did it, and then give me 31 other things that happened in the first 36 months of their tenure, but they decided to be cynical. They vet with their friends at a beer. They talk about it in the girl's bathroom. They tell their mother, but they never told me or the organization. It is the great shortcoming of employees in our world today. My friends, call the company's bluff. Call the bluff. I mean, if you haven't gone to HR or to the CEO or however your world is structured, well then you have no legs to stand on that the company stinks. If you have and they haven't delivered, vent away. But until you call the bluff, then you're just complaining because you like to complain. Before you go, yes. I have, I have two questions if I could have two favors. One is a photo. Yep. And the other thing is oh, I have a, a book right here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> here. 
here. I have a pen. Oh, also, I forgot. I had some blueberries. And oh, some my God. Oh, you're amazing. <laughs> and a Jets thing, you're yes. amazing. I couldn't wait, bring wait, the you Jets here. here. That's you guys awesome. like to make you feel at home. You're so sweet. <laughs> that is seriously. How do you spell your name? 